love tinkering with my tech, and when it comes to my framework laptop, it's been my trusty companion for the past two years. I've pushed it to its limits, hooked it up to a Thunderbolt eGPU before it was even officially certified, and even designed and built a mechanical keyboard enclosure for the old 11th gen mainboard when I upgraded to the 12th gen. And now that I've pre-ordered the Ryzen mainboard, I'm itching to build a powerful desktop enclosure for the 12th gen board that's compact and fully functional. Of course, I know Framework has developed a 3D printable mainboard case and partnered with Cooler Master for another one. Both are fantastic, but I want something that includes a power supply and dedicated graphics card. So I've been working on a design, but I needed a 3D printer with a big enough build volume to bring it to life. Enter the Artillery Sidewinder X2. With its massive 36,000 cubic centimeter build volume, can it help me quickly create the framework desktop enclosure of my dreams? Let's dive in and find out. Hey guys, CJ with Elevated Systems, and this is version 1.1 of a new framework project. It's a super compact, super efficient, and super powerful desktop PC built from repurposed components and housed in a custom design and 3D printed enclosure. So today I'm gonna show you how this all came together. I'll show you the design process, the tools I use to produce the case, namely this Artillery Sidewinder X2 3D printer. We'll put it all together and of course test it it out to see how it performs. All right, so let's kick things off by breaking down the various elements that make up this PC. Each of these components played a significant role in shaping the overall design of this rig. Now, taking a bit of an unusual route, we're going to dive in starting with the power supply. We're looking at a 200 watt 80 plus gold flex ATX PSU, which originally belonged in my Inwin B1 mini ITX case. Unfortunately, that case took a dive while I was moving stuff around in storage. Uh, rest in peace B1, but hey, it's not a total loss as I'm able to repurpose the power supply for this project. The downside of this power supply is the 200 watt limit and the absence of extra PCIe power, which limits our options when choosing a graphics card. For the longest time, I was set to roll with a GTX 1650 low profile, but then I found a bunch of these NVIDIA RTX A2000s up for grab on the secondhand market. This is a professional card rocking the NVIDIA GA106 GPU, the same ampere die you'll find in the RTX 3050 and 3060. It's got 3,328 CUDA cores, 104 tensor cores and 26 RT cores and a neat six gigabytes of GDR6 memory on a 192 bit bus. The kicker, it maxes out at a total board power of just 70 watts, all of which can be drawn straight from the PCI lane. Speaking of PCIe, the interface I'm using for this build is a PCI by 16 to Thunderbolt 3 interface from my Razer Core X eGPU enclosure. I chose this solution for a few reasons. Firstly, I had the Razer in storage unused it's also a proven reliable interface that I've had a good experience on with my framework laptop. On top of that, it features 24 pin and eight pin EPS power inputs to juice up the PCIe device and deliver 100 watt power via the Thunderbolt connection to the PC, meaning I can power the whole system off the sync power supply. It even comes with a 12 volt van connector. I'll dive deeper into the PCIe interface and other potential alternatives later on, so make sure you stay tuned for that. Now, let's get to the main component, the heart of the system. The Intel i7-1260P powered framework mainboard. It's got 12 cores, 16 threads with four performance cores and eight efficiency cores, clocking in at a base frequency of 3.4 gigahertz and a boost of 4.7 gigahertz and a base TDP of 28 watts. I've kitted it out with 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3200CL16 memory, a 500 gigabyte Gen 3 SSD, and an Intel Wi-Fi 6 card. Now that we've checked out all the pieces of the puzzle, let's turn our attention to the case that's gonna house all these components. The design for this case was fairly straightforward, taking cues from the Razer Core X and Johnsbo V11. In fact, my first thought was to tweak the Johnsbo case to accommodate all these parts, but I crave something more compact, so I hopped onto Fusion 360 and designed a basic prototype, essentially an inner tray to mount the components and an outer ventilated case for protection. Nothing too complex. I've actually had this design mostly finished for over a year, but didn't have a 3D printer with the capacity to bring it to life. Then, a few weeks ago, Artillery 3D reached out, offering their Sidewinder X2 for me to check out. Now, 
When I was scouting for larger printers, for larger prototypes, I'd considered the Sidewinder X2, but I wasn't convinced. There weren't many reviews yet, and looking at the 300 millimeter squared glass bed and direct drive extruder, I thought it wouldn't be able to handle the speeds I was after. Turned out, I might have been onto something. When a brand sends me a product, I'm under no obligation to actually review it, and I've not produced videos on a few items that weren't bad, but weren't impressive enough to share with y'all. However, I've never had a product just fail, which is what happened with the Sidewinder X2. It had a few hiccups, one of which was the BL Touch probe getting bent during a print, which threw off the auto leveling and caused the nozzle to hit the bed at the start of a print. I was able to manually level the printer and Artillery's customer service was prompt in responding and I have a replacement probe on the way. But then with about 80 hours of printing, I started to experience serious under extrusion. I tried troubleshooting, cleaning the hot end, replacing the nozzle, checking all my settings, but then I heard this. That crunching noise, that's the extruder gear gnawing at the filament. The flat extruder pulley that applies tension against the filament so the feed gear can feed it is binding up. This might be a straightforward fix, but it means taking the printer offline, disassembling and troubleshooting the whole print head assembly. That's only a bit of an inconvenience for me and it means I can't showcase the sleeker feature packed version 1.2 of the enclosure today as I had planned, but for the average consumer, it likely means their printer is out of commission and they'll have to navigate the RMA process or perhaps consider a product return or exchange. Despite the hiccups though, it started off as an impressive printer. The first print of the internal mounting tray came out in under 18 hours at a print speed of 100 millimeters per second. The case printed in about 24 hours and the only minor issue was some ghosting around the vent holes. After mocking up the components on the first tray and taking measurements, I made a few minor adjustments to the model and reprinted it. The results were again impressive. You can barely see the layer lines. I was anticipating some layer shifting from a printer this large printing at these speeds, but it was smooth sailing. Everything was dimensionally accurate and all my components fit precisely as I intended. The only hiccups were down to human error, so I had to do a little bit of tweaking on the part, no big deal, just make the changes and reprint it. <laughs> all right, I'll walk you through all the design tweaks shortly, but for now, let's just work with what we have on hand because, well, well, that's what we got, and putting it all together was actually pretty seamless. For this iteration, I've got all the hardware mounted on stainless steel standoffs in the enclosure. The PSU sits at the bottom of the tray with the fan facing down to draw air in from the bottom of the case. The main board is fixed on the right side so I can access all the components on the top, but the fan actually draws air from the bottom, so through the ventilation hole in the main board tray. The right side vent holes are more for uniformity than for airflow. As with all my framework projects, I like to retain the bays for the expansion cards, and for this case, I've got two bays situated at the rear. The graphics card finds its home on the left side. I also hooked up the Wi-Fi card to the main board and leveraged the same internal antenna I used for the CJ64. Now, there's one slight hiccup with the design. The power delivery from the Thunderbolt card is at the back. So to power up the main board, I need to plug it into the rear of the case and then reroute the cable back into the case so that it can plug into one of the front Thunderbolt ports. A bit of a roundabout, but it works. I've got a 120 millimeter fan installed at the front of the outer case. Once everything is hooked up and ready to go, the inner tray just glides right into the case. As simple as that. All right. So we've got it all set up and it's time to put this machine through its paces. You may recall from my framework versus Ryzen versus MacBook video where I highlighted the significant setback for the Intel CPU when compared to its rivals, its subpar GPU performance. However, with the introduction of a dedicated graphics card, the game has entirely changed. Now, it's important to note that a graphics card might not bring significant improvement to all activities. Take photo editing, for instance. Unless you're leaning heavily on GPU accelerated filters or effects, 
you won't see much of a difference. For straightforward video editing, particularly when dealing with common DLSR or mirrorless camera footage in X264 or X265 format, Intel's media encoders and decoders might even outperform a GPU in some instances. But here's where things get better. If you're dealing with more complex raw footage, <laughs> brace yourself for some serious leaps in editing performance. And for my 3D design and rendering enthusiasts out there, a GPU is going to be an absolute game changer. I'm seeing huge improvements in Blender rendering over the 1260p alone. The RTX A2000 being a professional grade card comes with professional driver package. This means it can handle professional applications that the framework laptop wouldn't typically be equipped to run on its own. But I know what you're all really here for. Can it handle gaming? The answer to that actually surprised me a little. Now, due to the equipment problems, I only had time to test a few games, and while I'm pretty sure the A2000 can run on the NVIDIA Game Ready drivers, I just left the professional drivers installed for testing. I kick things off with The Last of Us Part 1 with patch 1.0.5, all games were tested at 1080p with DLSS balance setting enabled if available. For The Last of Us, I set the game at the high preset and dropped some texture and geometry settings to medium until I met the 6 gig VRAM limit. Jumping into the game, the first thing to notice is the A2000 isn't hitting the same 60 plus FPS that the RTX 3050 can at these settings. However, if you look at the frame time graph, we're getting fairly steady frame times, but there are consistent micro stutters throughout play. The surprising part is that it's the CPU power and thermal limits that's holding back the potential performance of the low power GPU. The CPU can only briefly hit max boost clocks under bursty single threaded workloads. In sustained multi-core workloads like modern AAA gaming, it's restricted to its base 25 watt TDP and to an average clock speed of about 3.2 gigahertz Unlike say a desktop 12 600K, which has the power and thermal headroom to maintain sustained boost clocks of 4.7 gigahertz or higher. We can see this heavy CPU bottleneck in action when I drop to DLSS performance and to the medium preset, but the game performance remains unchanged. However, if we switch to a game like Tiny Tina's Wonderland, which is heavily GPU dependent and doesn't leverage CPU power much, at 1080p native high presets, we're getting a very smooth mid 70s FPS average with the GPU able to hit 100% usage without the CPU holding it back. If we look at a title that's more balanced between CPU and GPU usage, God of War at 1080p DLSS balanced, high preset, we still have a bit of a CPU bottleneck. However, the A2000 is still able to work close to full power and deliver a nice smooth 67 FPS average with 1% lows of 51. Now, Cyberpunk 2077 demonstrates a worst case scenario. At 1080p DLSS balanced high preset, this heavily CPU dependent title isn't what I would call playable with the GPU being dragged down as low as 40% usage as it waits on the CPU to do its job before it can render frames. This results in horribly choppy frame times and gameplay. Again, if we drop to DLSS performance, there's zero change with our 1% lows still in the teens. This is precisely the reason I selected a low power GPU for this build. The low power CPU is always going to be the limiting factor bottlenecking any higher end GPU you attempt to pair with it. All right, so where do we head from this point? You see, this is essentially a working prototype, a minimal viable product of sorts. It's clearly missing a few fundamental components like this power button, which is set to be positioned right here on the top of the case, which thanks to Frameworks published schematics, I can wire directly to the motherboard. Plus, the system could definitely use a bit more flexibility beyond the two expansion slots at the back. So I'm including four USB-C ports with a 10 gigabit speed right at the front. I basically gutted a USB-C hub and integrated the PCB directly into the case 
plugging it into the last free front Thunderbolt port. I gave the front a slight makeover, opening it up and throwing in a distinct grill panel. I also made sure to stamp my logo on it. Instead of using ventilation holes on the three sides of the case, I decided to install a large window where I plan to place a screen similar to this one. This tweak is bound to increase the printing speed. The tray remains the same as the previous unsuccessful print. I expanded the PSU compartment to fit larger power supplies and incorporated standoffs into the tray. These will be equipped with threaded inserts to mount the mainboard and PCIe adapter. I also decided to cut down on some material for the sake of print speed and efficiency. Remember though, even this updated version is still a prototype. The Intel 1260p heats up to a whopping 100 degrees Celsius, even under moderate load, and an entirely plastic case is not gonna survive long. So while I intend to keep most of the casing 3D printed, likely using ASA filament, I'll definitely be replacing at least these sections of the internal tray with something a bit more robust like 14 gauge aluminum. All right. For those of you looking to craft your own iteration or tweak the blueprint a bit, once I'm done fixing up this printer and confirming the revised model is mistake free, I'll be dropping the STLs along with the CAD files on my GitHub. I'll make sure the link is in the description as soon as those files are live. Now, hopefully that's swift provided I don't need to wait on parts for this printer. However, the part aspects might be a bit of a hurdle for my DIY folks out there. I wouldn't advise shelling out $400 to $500 on an eGPU closure only to yank the PCI adapter out of it. While you could potentially find these Razer enclosures pre-owned for less than $200, that's still a bit wasteful unless you've got a plan to repurpose the remaining components. Unfortunately, while there are alternative solutions, both in the form of Thunderbolt and M.2 adapter options, none that I came across could provide the necessary 100 watts of power delivery to the main board. And those budget M.2 adapters without any extra power input simply don't even have enough juice to power the graphics card. So it's best to steer clear of those. The best I could track down were cards delivering 60 watts, which unfortunately can't power the Intel board without a second external power supply or backup from the laptop battery. Now, while you'll have the CAD files to modify the enclosure to fit any PCIe adapter you manage to get your hands on, I'm also planning on uploading a version two of the enclosure design. This one will be a bit taller, making room to install the framework battery below the main board. The increased height also means it will accommodate full-size graphics card and maybe even a standard SFX power supply. I can't promise a full follow-up video on this, but I'll definitely keep you in the loop with community updates and posts on my social media, so make sure you're subscribed and following me to stay in the loop. I'll certainly be posting video updates on my Patreon because thanks to the amazing small community over there, I'm able to fund these creative endeavors. If you're interested in supporting this project further, please consider becoming a patron. And a quick note for my patrons, following my iMac to framework mainboard conversion, I'm still on it. I've hit a bit of a power supply snag that requires an innovative solution, but once that's sorted, I'll be pushing forward exclusively on Patreon. If you got any questions or ideas about this project, don't hesitate to drop them in the comments. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.